Hey, this is Dan Wunderlich from Defining Grace, and welcome to Art of the Sermon, a show for preachers, teachers, and communicators. My guest today is Leslie Jordan, and you probably know her as one half of the worship band, All Sons and Daughters. She and her bandmate, David Leonard, are not only touring musicians, but they spend a lot of time working with and leading worship in their local church. And so today, I talk with Leslie about writing for and leading worship, their love for the local church, as well as All Sons and Daughters' new project, Poets and Saints. Well, my guest today is Leslie Jordan. She is one half of the worship band All Sons and Daughters with her friend and musical partner, David Leonard. Leslie, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on. Awesome. Well, many of our listeners are probably familiar with your band All Sons and Daughters, but they may not know much about you and the stuff that you and David do off the stage. So would you mind telling us a little bit about uh, yourself both on and off stage? Yeah. So David and I met, oh gosh, now it might be seven years ago in 2009, and uh, both had a passion to write songs for the church, and so that, that's really how we got started. We both were a part of a, a community here in Franklin, Tennessee called Journey Church, and uh, we were introduced by the worship pastor at our time at the time, and he just said, hey, both of you have expressed the desire to write songs for, for these folks, so why don't you give it a shot? Neither one of us had written church music before, so we were like, okay, let's, let's see what happens. And, uh, and we were pleasantly surprised with how easy it was and how fun it was. And, and, and really for us, it was, it was easy because we were rooted in such deep community, both of us. So our, um, my husband, Thomas and myself were a part of a small group and had been attending journey for a while and David and his wife the same. And, and so it just, it was kind of a natural expression of, of what God had been doing in our, each of our lives and stories. And, uh, so we've been a part of that community since, um, gosh, I've been there since 2007, and I think David since 2008. And so it, we're still we're still a part of that community. We had our first service yesterday, and we're kind of going through this crazy transition. And so we're we're meeting in like a taekwondo gym right now. <laughs> so <laughs> cool. like, it, if anybody thinks church gets easier, it, it sometimes it it just gets harder. And uh, but the body is just as beautiful as it as it has ever been for us. And so we spend a lot of time with our church family when we're not on the road and, and, uh, in our, in our small group communities and our neighborhoods. And, and, um, and that's kind of what we, what we do for, you know, the time that we're off the road and we write songs and hang out with friends and, and, uh, and then we're getting ready to head on a tour here in a few weeks, so we're gearing up for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to let you know, I got the chance to meet you both for the first time a couple years back where you did a tour where you invited local worship leaders to come to a lunch. Uh, and, and in that room, it really hit me. You guys don't just write for the church. You don't just want to sell us records and t-shirts, but you really care about the church and the people who are leading the church. And so do you mind talking yeah. about your love for the church? I know you've also done some other experimental things with the local church on tours following that. So can you talk a little bit about those tours? Yeah, definitely. So the the luncheon for us, we when we first started touring, it, it really was out of obedience. I think both of us were ready to be home. Um, I, I was I'm, I'm geared more for home, uh, so being on the road felt like a it, like I said, it was an obedience. And so for us, it was like, how do we stay rooted and grounded and balanced both um, on the road and at home? And and I think the best way for us that we knew how to do that was to incorporate conversations with local communities. And, uh, and so we just started brainstorming, what are some, what are some ways that that could work? And, and, um, and so we thought a lunch would be really cool. What if we just gather a bunch of local worship leaders and had lunch and ask some questions and, and we're just intentional with our time. Touring can be such a, um, fantasy sometimes, like you're kind of, it's not reality. You know, you're living on a bus, right, you're, right. you're in a different city every day and, and, and you can become really isolated and, and it can be a really lonely place to be. And so, it, it, it part of it was selfish. It was for us to go. How do we stay rooted in in the church when we're away from home and uh, and connected to a greater a greater purpose, a greater vision? So that was the first thing we did was worship leader luncheons on our tour a couple years ago with Tim Timmons, and we just had a blast with that. It was so much fun, and uh, and and we're kind of always like we're innovative thinkers, so we're like, okay, well that works. That was great. W- what else can we do? And uh, and so we would end our nights with Q and A's. That was another way to do it. So instead of doing the luncheons, we just said, what if we spend 15 to 20 minutes after each night where we sit on the front of the stage and we just talk about what we experience together with people. And I, I think a lot of times that's what people are longing for when they say, Oh, can I get a picture with you? Or, Hey, can we, can I have an autograph or can I tell you a story? Like there's, 
there's a desire to make a connection and we yeah. have that same desire, but, but sometimes the, the merch table feel <laughs> it, it, it's incongruent with what we just experienced sure. with each other. And, and so for us, it was how, you know, how do we, how do we do this on Sunday morning? You know, we stand down and we hang out with folks who come up and, 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 and we make connections. And so we thought that would be another way to do it. And then last fall, we actually did this thing called the neighborhood tour, which was really fun for us. We had done an experience like this up in Toronto and um, with a good friend of ours, a promoter up there, Paul Kelly. And we had five shows, I think, in and around the Toronto area. And then on the fifth day, we did a day-long worship conference for uh, worship pastors and pastors. And we were like, well, we know Canada is kind of weird, but we <laughs> love Canada. So this could work in Canada. Could it work in the States? And and what if we gave this thing a shot and we called it Neighborhood Tour and and we just really put an emphasis on on local worship leaders knowing each other. Mm. And we gathered, you know, we did two or three shows around one city. And then on the third or fourth day, we invited all of those worship pastors to come and, and spend the day with us. And and that was an absolute blast for us. It was, again, very experimental. I like that word because yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're kind of always... We're kind of always like, would this work? Do people want to do this? And they show up to it. And, and we just have so much fun in those in those moments with people and talking story about how how is the church growing? How is the church moving? How is the spirit moving in the church around the country? And and uh, it's it's just been it's been a blast. That for us is so life giving, more so than playing shows and riding on a tour bus around the country. That those are the those are the real nourishing moments for us. Well, many of our listeners are pastors or seminary students who may be pastoring or will be pastoring soon. And so I wanted to ask you, what might be one or two really important things that pastors need to know or can do that would help out their worship leaders and volunteers? Oh, gosh, we actually had this conversation with our pastor last year. So we were like, what would be some cool things to teach on? And, and he was like, what if I met with the worship leaders and you met with the pastors and we just shared, like, here's some really important things to know. So that's great you're asking that question. I think FaceTime, you know, there's a lot of times that worship pastors um, or worship leaders in the church, if they're lay leaders, may not get FaceTime with the pastor. Mm-hmm. And and I know that, that there's an expectation there that, like, every, everybody who leads the church is best buds and, and are kind of all on the same page. But for us, the relational side of, of what we do together on a Sunday uh, in our gatherings it it really has to stem from a relationship with each other. Otherwise it feels disjointed and we're asking people to do something that we haven't yet done together. And, um, and so I think there's, there can be friction there sometimes because pastors can be, you know, more of the driven, um, you know, communicating mm-hmm. and the worship leaders can be more of the emotional <laughs> responsive yeah, yeah. Uh, types. And so I think, you know, sometimes there's personality differences and I think there's a lot of beauty in, in learning how to work through those things together again. So, so that you're, you're an example for the people you're leading because you're asking them to walk out life together and be in community together. And so I think that's a really important aspect for the staff or for the lay leaders uh, who are leading alongside the pastors is just FaceTime relationship, um, being a part of each other's lives so that when you come to lead together, it's a really natural thing. Yeah, that's so important. Well, and uh, one of the main reasons that I wanted to talk to you today is, of course, you all have a new project coming out called Poets and Saints. It's an album, but it also has a whole bunch of uh, other uh, things that go alongside of this project. And so would you uh, share with our listeners how you view this project, how it came about, and what you think is so special about it? Yeah, it it was like um, the snowball effect <laughs> to... To the craziest degree, I was reading a book by Madeline LaEngle called Walking on Water, and she's quoting the the play Our Town, and two characters are speaking to each other, and one says, does anyone experience life as they live it? And the response mm. was, no, saints and poets do, some of them, maybe. <laughs> and so LaEngle goes on to talk about this grouping of people, poets and saints. Why did they live life in the present? What is it about them that is able to transcend time and they can just sit right in the, right in the moment that they're in? And why do they create art? Why do they, why do we, you know, and so it just, it got my, my mind rolling and I was like, why do we still sing hymns that were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years old? Why do we still look at art that is, has been painted, you know, centuries ago and we're still moved by that? What is in those pieces of art and music that that connects with us? And 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 I believe it's the spirit of God. And 
And so it, that's where it started. It really started just at a very simple, what if we just studied a handful of people and wrote songs from their stories? Because we believe that we're in a, in a current poets and saints context at our church. Mm. We believe we have a ton of people who are trying to figure out how to live lives creatively uh, and outside what maybe the social cultural norm says to do. And so we said, what if we go backwards into some of these stories? Would we find that some of their stories resonate with ours? And could we write songs that, that feel ancient, but yet present? And, uh, and so the more we started talking about that idea, the, the more um, the conversation generated into this uh, what if scenario. We're like, well, what if we took a trip to Europe? And what if we went to the cities where they lived and and what if we took our pastor and what if he wrote a book and then what if you know it's like <laughs> yeah. all these different things and it, and it and it turned into this this monster of a project uh that's essentially a small group curriculum not just for church small groups but but any small group mm-hmm. a family a group of friends your neighbor uh your neighborhood um and uh and so it's a it's a collection of of songs of stories of of photos um and it's a a 7 day seven week study. So mm. there are seven poets and saints we took for the, the curriculum, the small group curriculum. And, uh, and we took a film team with us. And, and so in each of these cities, we, uh, we studied one really human characteristic of this person's life. So C.S. Lewis, we talked about vulnerability for him. And, and some people may know his story that when he was in Oxford, he had a, a group of buddies and they hang out, they hang out at a local pub weekly and they talk about theology and struggle and life. And there is this desire for all of them to live very vulnerably with one another. And and we kind of wondered, did this vulnerability, this way of life for him impact how and why he wrote the stories that he wrote? And, uh, and so we just, we started asking some of those questions and we caught it all on film and, and it was really just our in the moment reactions to things. So we didn't go in with a lot of head knowledge. We brought a friend of ours, Sarah McIntosh, who did all of the research on the front end for us and gave us some things to read each day. And, and so that was kind of, we wanted to model for people what their experience could be like. So in the same, in the same way we're asking people to go through this study, it's, we're just kind of, you know, the, hopefully the, the first example of, of how the conversations could go. And then along with the DVD is a, is a participant's guide that each day gives you something new to experience, a meditation, a prayer, um, uh, a reaction to a question or an image. And then on the seventh day, whatever day your small group meets, there's a little bit of extra meat content to the, to this person's story. And, uh, and then there's discussion questions for when your group meets together. So they really all kind of go together and, and there's, there's beautiful stories woven in from our pastor's book. Jamie, uh, George wrote a book called Poets and Saints along with our record. And, and so they, they all just kind of complement each other really well. And uh, again, it was a bear of a project and we're, <laughs> we're really excited because we think it's going to hopefully cultivate some, some new conversations in the church and in our families. Well, you all were kind enough to share both the record and a copy of the book with me to prepare for this interview, uh, and they are both incredible. In fact, this is my favorite album that you all have put together. Uh, and, oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And for our listeners, this episode comes out on Thursday, September 1st, and so the album and all of the accompanying materials will be available tomorrow on Friday, and so you can go and get it. In fact, if you are so eager today, you can pre-order the album today and get about half of the album uh, as part of the pre-release packages. Uh, but there, but th- this album has such an incredible mix of both familiarity and evolution. It sounds like an All Sons and Daughters record, but there are very clearly new sounds and new areas that you all were experimenting with. I also love that you bring in hymns and poets, but this isn't just like a hymn cover album. Uh, there's original writing as well, as well as arrangements of historical writings. And so are there any favorite moments from putting this record together that you'd like to share or maybe specific things you want folks to listen for? Oh, yeah, I mean... I love I love that you feel that way about it. I think that's the hope. Is like this, it feels like us, but it's it's pioneering something new and but something ancient at the same time. So that's that's awesome. There there are so many special moments on this, but one thing that I'll, I'll speak to David's creativity. Um, the other half of the band, he's <laughs> he is so hyper creative and and he's always thinking about sounds and and ways to incorporate things. And so he he found this little uh, recorder called an OP one. And he took it with us on the trip to Europe last summer. And so we thought, what if, what if we could capture some of the sounds of these places and, and weave them into whatever mm-hmm. we record? So 
we, um, one night we're in Normandy and we're studying St. Therese and our bus driver goes, Hey, I think we could get to Paris via Omaha beach. It'll just take an extra hour. Wow. Do you want to go there? <laughs> All of us were like, yes, we absolutely yeah. want to go to Omaha beach. And, uh, and our filmmaker, he was our film guy. He was like, okay, if we're going to Omaha beach, I want to sing greater you Lord. Like I want to capture the three of you sitting there and, and our, us and our cellist and, and, uh, and so it was almost midnight, the longest day of the year. It was one of the most memorable experiences of my life. We pulled up and it's just quiet. And we, we get off the bus in a rush and we, we sing through Greater You Lord once. We film it and the sun's still going down and it's almost midnight. And so after we're finished, we walk out onto the beach. And this is, you know, the site of D-Day. This is lives hundreds of lives lost mm. um, in this. And so we're just standing in this moment and we're kind of, contemplating all of these thoughts and emotions and um and david had his op1 with him and he thought he he just he started recording the waves he's like what a what a beautiful sound this you know in the silence of the night the waves hitting the ocean and and so you know we kind of put that memory in our in our bank we got on the bus and kept going and and so when we got back and we started writing these songs the first song we started working on was a song for c.s lewis called Heaven Meets Earth. It's the first track on the album. And uh, we wanted to write the creation story from The Magician's Nephew where Aslan sings Narnia into existence. And so we are like, what would that passage sound like if it was a song? And, uh, and, and we, you know, we're talking about the water meeting the land. And mm. we're like, David goes, I have this sample <laughs> of, of the water hitting the beach in Omaha, on yeah. Omaha Beach, like, is there a way to put this on the track? And as he's playing this sample, the wind hit the microphone in this really kind of unique way. And it sounded like a heartbeat. It was like a bump, 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 bump. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we looped that and that actually turned into the beat of heaven meets earth. So you hear that backbeat and, and it's the wind hitting a microphone wow. as the waves are hitting the <laughs> pretty, pretty surreal. Like it sounds <laughs> yeah. like we made that up, but that really happened. And, and so there's little nuances throughout the record of, sounds um that you know we kind of wove into songs but we wanted to make the songs feel like the places we visited so we, we tried to do that as best as possible oh that's so cool and one of the things that i appreciate being a pastor and planner of worship as well as worship leader is the depth of your songs and all of your albums have had this theological and artistic uh, depth to it. In particular, a pet peeve of mine is the lack of modern worship songs that acknowledge or handle the Trinity. And the Trinity has some really big moments on this album. So I, I just wanted to say thank you for that and appreciate it. In the introduction to the book, uh, your pastor, Jamie George, writes, our inspiration comes from the past, our hope lies in the future, and our perspiration is in the present. I was wondering if you had any words of encouragement for pastors and worship leaders out there who may be kind of burned out with all of the conflict and fighting that comes with church music and just want to do what you've done here, which is connect the richness of church history with the opportunities and, and openness of people today? Yeah, I think any time you walk into something, any time anytime that's something that's outside of what you're used to, for, for us, we haven't really done much time. We haven't spent much time in, in the, the Catholic faith. <laughs> yeah. And so this, this project for us was like a stretch to go. All right, we have lived in in Protestant Southern America our whole lives, most of us um, that were on this trip. How do we stretch ourselves outside of of what we're used to to explore and experience truths that have existed longer than even our own traditions? Mm. And I think sometimes we can become so hyper focused, so narrow in our way of seeing things that we forget that God works outside the bounds of time, of space, of expectations, of, of even our own understandings of God. He works outside that. He works beyond that. And, and for us, we thought these are all humans that have been influenced by God and culture. And then in turn, they influenced culture and the church. And I feel like that's what a lot of times pastors and worship leaders go into these roles because there is a desire to, to impact and to influence change in the same way that they were impacted and, and were influenced. And so there is, I, I think sometimes um, a tirelessness in our search and our pursuit for peace and for, 
for rightness in what we do and why we do it. And, and I would just say for, for us, what we've experienced is that it all comes so much more naturally when we're open-handed, when we don't mm. paint the expectation of what we want the outcome to look like. We had no idea what this project would turn out to be. We just said, you know, like I told you, it was just a series of what if questions. What if, what if we explored some of these things? Would we find these stories really resonated with our own? To me, it doesn't bother me that Francis was a Catholic friar, a monk, you know, because I'm yeah. going, his story really resonates with my story. I'm or, like St. Therese, all these people. We just we just talked about St. Augustine yesterday in our church service, and, and we're a non-denominational Southern church. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, there's real beauty when we can get outside of our fears of it all has to be completely in line with everything that I believe, all of my doctrine, all of my theology. I I think that there's some really beautiful truths beyond what we even know to expect when we're willing and open to explore those things. Yeah, and we've mentioned St. Therese a couple times, and I wanted to specifically ask you about the song based on one of her writings and on her life, You Are Love and Love Alone. This is absolutely my favorite song on the whole album, both musically and thematically. And in the book, Pastor Jamie describes uh, what she struggled with. He says, quote, she had a hypersensitivity to what others thought about her combined with a fear of disappointing God. Now, if that is not a common struggle for pastors and worship leaders, I mean, that that is probably <laughs> maybe the number one thing that, that that we all struggle with. And she learns to fight it with an intense focus on God's grace and love and how she can reflect those things to others. And so do you have anything about that song that you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah, we, we pulled um, inspiration for that song from a quote uh, from St. Therese. And, and it just says to love how perfectly our hearts were made for this. Mm. And I read that and I was like, Oh, I think that's what we all desire. We all long to feel like we were perfectly made for love um, and, and even really in our pursuit for other things. And, and she really embodied that she had this, you know, she embodied this practice of the little way that it's in the gathering of the simple things that really make the kingdom of God that much richer and alive and present. And so, you know, if we can, if we can hinge our days on the looks, the glances, the welcomes, the, the hugs, the family members, you know, the, the little things that we sometimes take for granted. When, when you look at all of those things piled up together, you see how rich and full and beautiful life actually is when it's walked out in the kingdom and in community with each other. And I, I think she really embodied that. And so her story for us was so inspiring. She, she died at 24 and she was like the youngest Carmelite nun and and for us, we're going. Oh my god! Okay, I'm like 31, and I'm like, what, what have I done with my life? <laughs> yeah. And she, you know, at 14, and, uh, and so it it was a really beautiful, inspiring story. And and we we even brought back some of that, the idea of how do we embody the little way? How do we how do we place our our values on the little things? And so we found an old hymn from a book called Poems of Power to Strengthen the Soul. It's a hymn by Frederick William Fair called Thou Art Love and Love Alone. And so the song is really just an adaptation of that old hymn, and uh, the bridge is is the quote from St. Therese, and that's where the song came from. That's great. Well, my last question for you today is, who are some of the poets, artists, or even other musicians that you turn to when you just want to be filled up or want to feel like you connect with God? What genres of music, maybe even artists or or, uh, writers and poets beyond that, who do you turn to? Yeah, uh, right now I have... um, I've really been drawing inspiration from um, a writer named Pat Schneider. She wrote a book called How the Light Gets In, and um, and it's writing as a spiritual practice. And so, I, like for her, for me, her life. She's 82 years old. I actually went and spent the weekend with her this summer, and and about 10 other writers. And I think I was one of like maybe three believers at this. It, it was it was the most diverse group of women, and uh, I had the I had the best time. I felt like I was a part of the kingdom in that moment. It was just wow. beautiful to hear people's perspectives and and life. And so this 82 year old woman opened up her home and uh, and and encouraged us to just write our own stories and and uh, and draw from a well of experience to understand deeper spiritual truths um, about God and about ourselves. And so she's, she's got a few books that I've just been, you know, drinking in um, music. I listen to, I'm a 
I'm a huge fan of Sandra McCracken. She's a good friend, and and she just wrote a new Psalms project called God's Highway. I think it comes out the end of September, and she's going to be on the tour with us this fall, um, which we're really excited about. But she is a a modern hymn writer. Uh, We wrote one of the songs on the record with her, You Hold It All Together. Um, And, uh, yeah, I, I think those are just a couple of the folks I'm drawing from right now. That's great. And if any of our listeners want to follow you and David online or where can they get the project, how can they keep up with what you all are doing? Yeah, everything right now is up for pre-sale, as you said, on our website, allsonsanddaughters.com or iTunes, Amazon. It's, it's going to be streaming on Spotify. All of that will be available on Friday, uh, September 2nd. And uh, all of the other content, the small group material that can be ordered through Amazon or, or our, our book publisher, David C. Cook or integritymusic.com. Um, and hopefully it's, it's going to be available everywhere. Eventually it'll all be digital. You can get digital books on iTunes, audio books, the participants guide. Uh, and I think the DVD through I, I movies, um, or through, sorry, iTunes in the movie section. So yeah, it, it should hopefully be available everywhere. Uh, you can check out our tour at allsonsanddollars.com, uh, slash tour. And I think we're going to be all over the place this fall. Yeah, that's great. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and sharing with us about this awesome new project. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Art of the Sermon. You can find show notes, including links to some of the things that we talked about at artofthesermon.com. As always, I would love to hear what you think about the show, and I want your input to be a part of the conversation. So you can connect with me through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, all at username Art of the Sermon. If you'd like to support the show, I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcast app so that new episodes are downloaded as soon as they're live. And of course, in addition to sharing the show with your friends, the best way to help us out is to leave a review in the iTunes store. This lets iTunes know that you care about the show and want other people to find it. Thank you again so much for joining me, and I'll catch you next time on Art of the Sermon.